Thank you very much, um, Kayla. Thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity. I actually couldn't attend last year's symposium um, because of uh, other commitments. And I was really excited when I received the invitation to this year's. And um, I think this is one of the uh, blessings in disguise of uh, working from home that we are able to connect and, and uh, be with each other even if we cannot uh, travel to be in person together so thank you very much um, for the invitation once again and um, I was going through some of the conversations that you've been having and, and the different papers and, and the initiatives like the 4.7 initiative and really congratulations on all the great work that has been going into this work and I've been following SDS and youth um, and the many initiatives that you've launched and done over the years uh, also the part Partnership that you have extended to my office, uh, for an example, by taking over the Reach Not Re Preach platform for a month and really making your voices heard within these platforms created in the UN. Um, thank you for, for part that partnership and um, please continue to do the very important work that you are doing. Um, let me um, start by stating the obvious, which is that the COVID-19 pandemic and as it continues to evolve, it's becoming increasingly clear that the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic will severely and disproportionately affect young people for years to come. Inclusive and future-proof quality education will be key to preventing a lost generation of bright, motivated young people being locked out of realizing their true potential. Education is a fundamental human right, a public good, and a public responsibility. For an example, you have been discussing education as a key entry point into the socioeconomic response to COVID-19. And we know that at the peak of the lockdown measures implemented around the world, school closures affected more than 1.6 billion children and young people. Today, um, nine months later, around one third of young people within this cohort still remain unable to access remote learning, missing out on crucial opportunities due to lack of internet, lack of infrastructure and technological equipments. Marginalized groups of young people, including young women and girls, disabled young people, have encountered even greater obstacles in being able to access and fully participate in education under the challenging con conditions of the pandemic. It's the long-term effects of COVID-19 that are particularly worrisome, in my opinion. 300, 317 million children are still affected by school closures and a shocking 10 million children are expected to have permanently dropped out of school. The most marginalized young people are experiencing particular devastation with approximately 50% of all refugee children in the world having left school and 20 million secondary school age girls out of school after the crisis has passed. Abrupt closures of schools and economic hardships caused by the pandemic have meant that a plethora of doors have suddenly closed for millions of young women around the world. A dramatic surge in child marriage and adolescent pregnancies are anticipated with up to an additional 2.5 million girls at risk of child marriage over five years to come. And adolescent pregnancies are expected to rise by up to 1 million in 2020 as a result of the economic impacts of the crisis. Without inclusive and equitable quality education for all, we cannot eliminate poverty or tackle inequality or fight climate change or achieve sustainable development or promote peace. Simply put, we have no chance at achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 without a firm commitment to inclusion and education. I particularly want to stress the fundamental importance of educating all young people on human rights and equipping them with the knowledge and skills to respect, demand and protect and uphold human rights of, for oneself and for their community. 
while this pandemic has fostered acts of solidarity and a common sense of humanity, the past months simultaneously have also seen a worrying rise in human rights violations, including hate speech, racism, discrimination, Human rights education for young people in both formal and non-formal settings promotes a common understanding that all human beings are equal and are equally deserving of dignity, respect and justice. It's incredibly empowering for young people to be recognized equally as active citizens who play an important role in upholding their own human rights and human rights of those others. Young people deserve to be able to meaningfully participate in public affairs that determine their future and democratic decision making that will decide their future for themselves. In today's world, effective, resilient and inclusive education means equipping young people with the knowledge and the skills they need to navigate and thrive in an increasingly changing world, marked also by digitalization, automation and rapid changes due to the fourth industrial revolution. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the central role of technology in keeping economies and health systems running, while also keeping young people learning and ensuring that everyone remains connected. In this aspect, it has revealed and exacerbated global inequalities, including strengthening uh, or, or heightening the digital divide. So we urgently need to address the growing digital gender gap and put digital technology to work for those who need it the most. The vulnerable, the marginalized, those who are living in poverty and often suffering from discrimination of different sorts. Young people everywhere in all their diversity have the right to an education, whether formal or informal, that is sensitive to their particular needs and contexts and equips them with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed in an increasingly complex world. So our response and recovery plans, and this is what I have been advocating, uh, not only with member states, but also with our United Nations teams in 104 countries who are now developing the socioeconomic response plans for the COVID-19 pandemic to in include young people in the consultations, to include young people in the design of those socioeconomic response plans, in those implementation, and most importantly, in, in uh, accountability, ensuring accountability for those socioeconomic response plans as well. Um, and digital connectivity in this quote-unquote new normal is going to be key not just for young people to be educated about these responses to the pandemic, but also to be able to meaningfully engage in shaping those responses and being a part of those responses in a way that it is affordable, safe and inclusive. So as we seek to build a strong recovery from the pandemic, we must work to reduce these harmful aspects of the exclusion of young people, but also lack, lack of access to digital technology and information that can hinder unleashing the power that it could potentially have as a true equalizer and a true enabler. Um, so it's been really a... Um, a pleasure to be listening to some of the things that you have been discussing, which are very much in line with uh, the priorities and policies and recommendations that I have been pushing in the context of the United Nations. And I really look forward to hearing some of your thoughts and your reflections, and most importantly, your recommendations um, to include further uh, as learnings from this symposium in my work and in my advocacy, um, trying to convince governments and the UN to substantially and sustainably invest, fund, provide resources, tools, and create safe enabling spaces online and offline for young people in all their diversity to equally participate uh, in these important processes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diathma. You covered so many of the topics that we discussed over the past two days. Um, so one of the first questions that we have is actually just about technology. So I think I'll start start there. Um, from Ivan, he wants to know, um, as young people, what should we do to help the regulation of technologies as AI, which have so many potentials to have problems, but also sometimes worsen these inequalities? Yes. Um 
so one of the key things is really to be able to uh, understand the impacts of artificial intelligence on our futures and in our lives. I've seen sort of interesting um, sort of what, what, what are those called predictions uh, for an example uh, how artificial intelligence could replace sort of certain jobs that uh, young people who are in schools or universities right now might be preparing for but might be taken away because of the uh, developments in technology and artificial intelligence at the same time there are predictions that says that actually these new technologies could potentially create new jobs and open up new opportunities for young people to uh, be employed and be involved in and, and actually use for the betterment of the economies and societies um, so, so so these arguments on both sides keep on happening but at the same time organizations like the un given how slow and bureaucratic and hierarchical they are, haven't really been able to keep up with uh, those uh, rapid changes or rapid developments and have been actually lagging behind when it comes to gathering member states together and, and all partners together, really, because it's not just member states, it's also the tech companies, it's also the private sector who has a great stake in uh, when it comes to regulating or sort of developing policy frameworks that help us regulate um, the development but also harmful effects of the development of technology. Uh, from the side of the UN, the most recent initiatives have been the establishment of the Secretary General's high-level high panel on digital cooperation and now there is a roadmap developed in order to further sort of take the recommendations of the high level panel forward and actually the secretary general has announced that next year he will be appointing a special envoy for digital technologies who will really be looking at these forward looking issues and advocating together with the, the secretary general for member states to come together to adopt such uh, global frameworks or normative frameworks that could potentially guide countries responses to uh, developing regulatory frameworks or, or policy frameworks works on this particular topic. So um, I would say, uh, please do uh, read a little bit about the, the, the digital cooperation framework and the roadmap and advocate with your government, with the organizations that you work with to apply this angle into the work that you are doing. It could be the work on education, it could be the work on employment, it could be the work on climate change or peace and security, because every aspect of our life is going to be impacted by rapid advancements of technology. And we really need to make sure that we are more future in the way that we look at these issues or what we call emerging issues. And I do think that young people have that advantage of being able to see this development and understand this development better as a generation with all due respect to all the generations. Uh, and, and you are able to come up with innovative uh, future-proof solutions that can help guide those responses. So uh, please be active and proactive and, and, and do get in touch with us as well. We'll be more than happy to put you in touch with those groups within the UN who are working on uh, digital cooperation and help you develop those partnerships to influence those processes. Thank you so much. I actually had four questions here and you answered them all in that one response. So thank you for, so much for that. Um, I have one more question um, from Zan. He says, in your role over this pandemic, have you been impressed by the attention paid to youth in UN decision-making and response, or do you think there still needs to be more done? If I'm being very honest, no, I've been very, I've been not satisfied. Uh, but that has actually been a, a part of my job, you know, just to be like, be a watchdog and be proactive and if i see something happening something important happening a policy being formulated and youth voices not being heard just to kind of knock on that door make sure that they open the door and bring young people into that conversation so wherever we have seen important initiatives being designed or important decisions being made we've tried proactively to bring young people into those conversations so starting from the policy papers that the secretary general published on 
COVID-19 response uh, from on education to mental health, to employment, uh, to social protection. We really integrated youth into those key recommendations that the Secretary General provided to governments. Um, we worked with uh, UNICEF and WHO for an example to uh, launch a series of mental health dialogues called Coping with COVID because the UN was not really paying attention on mental health uh, in the first few months of the pandemic. Uh, we tried uh, together with UNESCO and UNICEF again to highlight the investments in education together with global partnerships because we know that next year because of the pandemic, uh, the official development assistance by countries are going to significantly reduce and this has a risk of reducing investments that goes into education particularly um, and that's going to reverse the hard-earned progress we've achieved over the years. Um, so we've advocated a lot with the Global Partnership for Education and its replenishment to for donor countries particularly to keep their commitments to uh, the the funding for education, particularly in developing countries. Um, so a lot of this has been kind of looking at the spaces, identifying if young people are there or not, and, and really pushing for them to be included. Um, there have been certain instances uh, where institutions have proactively sought for the inclusion of young people within the design of those programs themselves. But unfortunately, still, I think young people come to mind for a lot of the times for institutions as an afterthought so you know you have a program you, you design everything and then oh we didn't have women here or we didn't have young people here or we didn't have uh, disabled uh, groups represented here and then you like organize a focus group discussion or a consultation and just like present it and yeah yeah and then you tick the box and that still happens unfortunately after so many years of advocacy um, and that's why I like to think that our work is not over and it's it's actually starting, you know, just because we have a youth strategy at the UN, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to adopt it and implement it in their day-to-day -day work. So um, we are continuing to do that work from within the UN system and really what you are doing also from outside, but in partnership with the UN really helps to bring that message and advocacy into life. So again, thank you for, for your work as well. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, I appreciate your honesty and, you know, your rawness. And I think that that's what we need right now is we need the facts and young people need to know that there are organizations and others trying to get their voices at the table and to have them included. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm very happy that you were able to. Um, you, it's, it's been a great two days. Um, I mean, thank you to yourself. Thank you to all, all the speakers over the past two days. I mean, I think a lot of outcomes have come out of here. Um, the last thing that I would kind of like to say is, you know, every don't give in to these anxieties of life. I mean, especially right now during this pandemic, right? Um, I want everybody to continue to fight for what they believe in while also supporting the work of, you know, all of their own fellow young change makers. And don't lose sight of your own goals, but the SDGs as well, because the only way that we'll achieve them is together. Um, just maybe, uh, Kayla, sorry, I, I don't want to sound so negative because I feel like I've only been talking about problems, <laughs> but I just want to also end on a positive note. And I think it's been incredible to see the resilience of young people. And I think we really need to respect the resilience and the leadership and, and the agency they showed throughout this crisis, right? losing jobs, losing education, mental health challenges. They still went out to the communities to help the most vulnerable people, did grocery shopping for elders, did communication campaigns online, set up hand washing campaigns in refugee camps. There are millions of such bravery, stories of bravery of young people while going through such difficult times themselves who stepped up to support their communities. And that's the spirit of leadership and, and boldness and sort of selflessness that we've seen from youth leaders around the world. And I've been very honored to document some of these stories through a blog series that I did every week. I highlighted these 10 stories of young people who were really out there in the front lines as unsung heroes. And, and if you have such stories as well, please do send them to us because we 
also need as kela said these stories of inspiration to know that you are not fighting alone or you're not advocating alone that there are so many others like you in their own contexts trying to achieve mm-hmm. the same goals as you so that is the network that is the community <laughs> i think that will help all of us uh, going and keep us going in very turbulent times like this so just wanted to end with a positive note thank you no 